Great story. Thank you so much, Diane. So many families are deeply affected by breast cancer, including my own. We lost my mother-in-law, uh, Doreen Conley, in June, and she fought a really heroic 10-year fight with this disease. So I want to share with you all a moment um, just a few weeks before she passed. Hold on, don't fall. <laughs> oh my gosh, you guys make me so nervous. So that was Doreen's approach to pretty much everything. In this moment, she was so positive. She uh, went to Dana-Farber Medical Center in Boston for 10 years of treatment. And every time she went in, she treated it like a social hour. She even enjoyed her infusions because she had so many friends there. It was incredible. You walk in and it was just like lunch with the ladies when she would go get her <laughs> treatments. And she really persevered until the very end. She very much did not want to go. And I think that's true of so many of our survivors, just like that as well, Miller. There's very much a passion to live in this community. I keep hearing over and over again, you know, a breast cancer diagnosis is not a death sentence. And oh, yeah. I think this morning is a testament to this, this spirit of, of surviving and enjoying life when we have it. I'm standing by right now with the uh, founders and the women who are running this organization. Susie Paddock, Vicki Carl, thank you so much for being here this thank morning. Thank you. What so do you fun. So fun. So what do you think this morning? I'm sure you're seeing some familiar faces. Oh, yeah. It's fun to come, isn't it? We just You see a lot of people you recognize every year, and it's just so fun to watch how much fun that these people have getting together one time a month, you know, one time a year, and for pink. It's awesome. And, the, and I mean, the community of breast cancer survivors is tight-knit. It's such a challenging shared experience. What's it like to have this many people around you who have such a, a common uh, struggle, but also a common hope? Well. I'm just looking around here, uh, my heart's pounding. Augusto, how you doing? This was your first one, what do you think? This was my first one. I had the best time, this was fantastic. This is an incredible community of people. I am very touched. I'd heard it was very special, and now I see that for myself. Okay, so Bertie, we had your story on um, this week. Tell us, how did it feel to get to be at the breakfast this morning? Um, how was this morning? I'm not usually a morning person, but <laughs> every, okay. once, every once in a while, I mean, once in a great while, I'll get up at 5 a.m. <laughs> Today, it was one of them. And I Thank you, Bertie. Thank you for being here. And I want to ask Kathy really quick as well. You brought your sister here this morning. Um, she's, not a morning person. she's not a morning person either. No. Kathy, how was the breakfast? It was fabulous. It was worth driving all the way from Powell, Wyoming. <laughs> all right. Have a great rest of your day and we will see you back on Montana this morning on Monday. Thank you all. Yellowstone County hosts one of the first ICWA courts established in the United States. What makes the court unique is its relationships with families. I talked to one mother who had her relationship with her kids restored through this ICWA court about what the program looks like on the inside. Lots to get to, but first, our top story this morning, new Montana laws restricting abortion in the state or at least temporarily on hold. As far as you can see across Billings and of course around Yellowstone County as well, the ground is saturated. It simply cannot soak in any more of this heavy rainfall. So we're seeing pooled water. We're seeing flood damage and I'm asking the city and the county what happens next and what you can expect. Homeowners getting their property tax bills in the past week. Some of course seeing hundreds of dollars of increase due to home valuations spiking across the state. So these valuations are adding to a long-term shift in Montana, where homeowners are paying an increasingly large share of property taxes in the state. In 1994, residential property owners paid 38% of all property taxes. In 2022, they paid 52% of all property taxes across the state. Um, the dramatic acceleration of uh, housing values and taxable value in the state this year it creates a different sort of scenario for voters now considering whether or not to approve local mill levies like we're seeing EMS services in Laurel, the Parks Bond in Billings, the new firehouse in Miles City, and they're kind of not just choosing whether or not these improvements are necessary. They're having to choose whether or not they're going to be able to afford their housing and pay for often much needed community services. So this spring at the legislature, although there were some short term property tax relief measures for homeowners, there were no long term changes to the general set of our of our tax system. Um, there were even some additions to this shift, like the business tax exemption. Um, do you have any long term plans to promote kind of a uh, shift from the burden of property taxes falling on residential homeowners. 
versus other sorts of property? Well, we did do permanent relief in this last legislative session, but I want to start, Augusta. Property taxes are too high. You've mentioned the, the tax rebates, which um, for the next couple of years, the majority of people in the state will have their tax increase covered. Mm -hmm. And the $120 million in permanent tax reductions, which some would argue actually contribute to homeowners ultimately paying more, uh, more of the burden of taxable value in the state because um, there aren't taxes coming in from other sources like like incomes. So I'm, I'm wondering, when can people expect to see the fruit of any long-term change actually affecting their lives in the state? Well, they're seeing it this year because... But on, uh, but on a long-term basis, this is the temporary solution to a problem that just accelerated very quickly, and our system is set up so that residential property owners are paying much more of the uh, property taxes generally in the state. So the rebates that they're receiving this year and next, $675 this year, $675 next year, more than offsets the increase that most homeowners are going to see. We need to do permanent relief, and that can't happen until the legislature's back in session. In addition, we did $120 million of relief and got that back into their pockets. In addition... Which wasn't very much money. If somebody makes 80000 a year, they got about 80 bucks. So that's not really a long-term solution for a systemic issue with residential property owners paying the majority of taxes in the state. Well, property taxes are too high, Augusta. Soak it in. I mean, like, it's Soak fine. It it's it's I just couldn't believe. I didn't know this story. And this morning, he's like, ugly sweater day. He pulls out the coat he wears every day. Hey, like, you know what? It's why my, do you do this to yourself? It's my jam. Like, it you is know, your jam. You know, it's a great, it's much. a great coat. Well, Jeff, thank you so much for coming in this morning, <laughs> yeah, spending the morning me. with us, Definitely. bringing Miss Minnie. I, I'm oh. pulling chinchilla hair out of my lipstick, <laughs> uh, but it's well worth it. She's fantastic. You will be yeah. for We've days really to come enjoyed out. her. It's just the sweetest thing. And you've brought some friends with you. I brought some critters. One who I've become quite tight with. But no pun intended. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but you're here to talk about your uh, uh, reptile expo coming up uh, this weekend. Mm -hmm. Welcome back to Montana this morning. Joining us now in studio, we have the Rhythm Destroyers. We have Z, Paul, Carla, Samantha, and Frank the Engineer playing for us this morning. We're really excited to have you, and you've got some shows coming up. Tell us about yes, this. Yes, we do. November 24th, we're playing at Levity. Okay, fantastic. And what are you playing for us this morning? We're playing two songs. Uh, we're playing Fever. Okay. And then the other one, we're playing a heart song called Crazy on You. Okay, fantastic. We're looking forward to it. We are continuing our segment, Holiday Crafts with the Q2 staff. We have longtime morning show director Rob Monaco. And of course, you know Haley, uh, Haley Monaco, uh, his daughter. So today, uh, the Monacos are going to show us their traditional family ravioli. They make every holiday season by hand. Take it away, Rob. It's really important that I redeem myself here because when I came back from Rome, I mistakenly said that uh, noodle flour, the noodles, noodles were easy to make, and I'm still paying for it, and I'm learning <laughs> today, maybe it's not so easy. <laughs> it's, it really is. I think our record is close to 400. 400, 400 raviolis. raviolis. Yes. 12 at a time. 421. Oh, he checked. Rob checked. 421, 421 is, the, is the record number of raviolis made wow. in and here. And that's like eight hours of hard work. So you're standing there with your 12 raviolis yep. at a time pan. Your family's assembling them. You have an older sister. Yes. So it's the four of you. Usually just the three. My dad, my sister, and me. Because your mom is like preserving the marriage yes. and like yes. off to huh. the side. <laughs> preserving the marriage. She's a non-Italian. Oh, she's a non-Italian, non so she can't. Okay. <laughs> we also have some great incentives beyond just all of the good work that we can do for the kids in our community. Uh, we've got a little image here, what? soon to come, of uh, our own Miller Robson with his future in about 12 hours. If we had $5,000 in donations this morning, Miller's going in the dunk tank this evening. <laughs> Somebody will be here tomorrow to get the weather. I don't know who. <laughs> 
Good morning and welcome to Montana this morning. So happy to see you all with us. We reached our goal and yes, look who showed up for work. I Miller did it. make it this morning despite Woo. yep going in the dunk tank yesterday. Big thank you to all yes. of you for that. We raised sixty two hundred dollars wow. with just the morning show drive in just a few hours. So really awesome. Yeah, thank you all. Crazy Taco Montana. Would you like me to make you something? It is a regular sight now around Billings. I love ginger, it adds such great flavor. Kai Clark plans to keep sharing his award-winning tacos for as long as possible. So this is the two specials, so it's a Korean. I have a couple people that I call them my stalkers. They'll come to every spot that I'm at. You'll find every flavor here. Here's our Thai vegetarian. He shares more than just the good stuff. I'm an open book. You can ask a lot of my customers. They, they all know my story. What's up, Kelly? What can I get you? I found um, safety and comfort in drinking to escape childhood traumas, abandonment, um, never having a dad growing up, things like that. And being a part of- How are you, sir? Of a community gave me so much um, self-worth. I'm gonna do steak. Steak today yes, and then sir. flour. Clark spent yeah. much of his life yeah. struggling with alcoholism. Now sober for two years. His customers and friends helping him carry the heavy burden of recovery. I never had that because I always isolated and so when I finally found people that would listen and knew that I wasn't the only one that had gone through the stuff that I went through. I'm the only one that experienced those things. Um, it became easier and easier and easier through the process. His family is now back in the picture too. That's something really special. Um, I haven't seen them in six years. His uncles watched years of struggle. When he would see things going right, he would say that he's not worthy of that, right? And then such, he would, he would sabotage it, right? And we would have that, that would happen over and over and over again. Now seeing his new life. I don't think that the family can be any prouder, right? It's just incredible. Kai Clark has one more roadblock ahead. You might not recognize him, but this is in 2021 when he got a felony DUI and sentenced to prison. Two years later, he's sober, but his past might be catching up with him. I mean, the consequences of my actions, I have to own, obviously, my addiction and my DUI and, ev and everything that happened, and, and yeah, I do. Clark may find out at his next court hearing as soon as this week that he has to serve his time. Our one single right here. Putting all, all this all on hold. I'm going to continue my sobriety and continue my journey and continue my story. It's not, it's not written yet. In Billings, Augusta McDonald for MTN News. White Crane's family is concerned about her mental health condition while awaiting further legal proceedings. They say she struggled with schizophrenia and bipolar disorder in her life and it got worse as she got older. We've been together over 20 years now. Stephanie Patman is White Crane's longtime partner. She was in jail when the shooting happened. Now she observes White Crane in her cell. Yeah, she don't look good at all. Her face is like real pale. Around her eyes it's like red, reddish purple. I mean, she, she don't look herself at all. This ain't no place for her, I tell you that. She ain't used to places like this. She don't, she don't get in trouble. White Crane's family says she struggles with bipolar disorder and has schizophrenia, and her neighbors reported she became increasingly paranoid in the weeks before the 14-hour standoff with police. A psychological evaluation is not ordered for White Crane at this time, but for people with mental illness who commit crimes in Montana, the path to resolution is long. Yellowstone County Attorney Scott Twido told me there are delays in determining even where to start. It's a long time, a year, to get these folks uh, even to the point where we can decide which route we're really going to take with them. If someone needs to go to the Montana State Hospital, the wait gets longer. The other delays that we notice are uh, getting people to the state hospital for uh, not only evaluation, but also treatment to see if they can become fit to proceed. I've noticed a, a significant increase in the delay or the time to get those folks uh, processed through the criminal justice system, which you know, puts pressure on everybody. Uh, I don't think, I don't fault the department. I think they're trying the best they can. And the answer as to why this is happening? Twido told me in part, the sheer number of people problems caused by COVID and a lack of resources. It's a complex problem steadily worsening over the years and taking a toll on inmates. 
when you look at her, she don't, she don't look right in here. She don't, she's not the person that I know. In Billings, Augusta McDonald, MTN News.